We'll make a start on our, on our final uh, plenary session of the uh, symposium. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Um, we have a, a, a change to the program. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Professor Mark Steers from the New Economics Foundation can't join us this afternoon. Um, but I'm very pleased that uh, Deb Bhattacharya, uh, who you will know from a panel session yesterday, is going to speak in this uh, session as well. Um, so thank you very much in, indeed. Um, this, this last session of the symposium is in, intended to kind of um, enable us to go around some of the themes that we've been debating and discussing, and I want to open it up into uh, some participation so that we can think about some ways forward from what we've learned and what's been discussed and debated here. Um, uh, and so the, the issues of, of um, the construction of evidence, uh, the ways in which evidence is collected, gathered, presented, uh, the kind of tests that you apply to evidence, the ways that they come into, into being and bear upon politics and policy making and the political context, um, these questions uh, that we've been discussing we will cover in, our, in different ways in our, in our presentations this afternoon. Um, and our first presentation is from Kerry Oppenheim. Kerry is the chief executive of a What Works Centre, the Early Intervention Foundation, which focuses on uh, early intervention, particularly in children's lives, but more broadly early intervention. Uh, she has been a number 10 advisor, she's run a think tank, she's been an academic, so she's incredibly well qualified to speak to you today. Kerry. Thank you very much, Nick, um, for inviting me. And can, can you hear me at the back? Does this work? Good, good. Excellent. Um, uh, I've been running um, the Early Intervention Foundation uh, for three years. So that feels to me still quite early, quite a new organisation. Um, and I thought I would just tell you a little bit about what it is we do in the context in which we were established um, and the way we approach thinking about evidence um, uh, to provide a kind of context for some of the issues we'll probably discuss as a whole. So um, we were set up in 2013. We are, this is really important, we are both a charity and a What Work Centre as opposed to just a What Work Centre. Um, and what we're interested in is supporting effective early intervention so that every child can fulfil their potential. Our current focus is on children where there are signals of risk, um, developing the most effective responses to that and using resources effectively. And um, Just to be clear, we're interested in both early on in a child's life, so the early years, critically important, but also when you, when you get in early, uh, in tackling an issue or a problem. We're part of this thing called the What Works Network. We talked in the previous session, some of us, about um, the What Works Centre uh, uh, on Wellbeing. That What Works Network was, and, um, the, the sort of came, came out under the uh, coalition government and was sort of layered on to a set of organisations that were very diverse, from NICE at one end to some new What Works Centres, small ones, at the other end. So they have very different structures, very different sources of funding. Um, they're all interested in evidence. There are, of course, many other organisations that do do evidence that are not work, work centred. Um, but we are we are one of one of those. And then I thought I'd just tell you a bit about the politics of where the organisation came from. So um, the person on the left who you might not know is Graham Allen. He's a Labour MP for Nottingham North. And the person on the right, you probably don't understand, is on the right, Vivian Duncan Smith, um, a former Secretary of State for the Department of Work and Pensions. What's interesting, I think, both about both individuals is they're quite maverick um, uh, and have been at different, um, different phases. They came together to write a pamphlet, um, which was um, the Smith Institute, you'll see in the corner, Smith Institute think tank. Um, which was Gordon Brown's sort of think tank, really, and the Centre for Social Justice, which was established by Ian Duncan Smith, um, to write uh, a book, I think it was in 2006, uh, around early intervention, Good Parents, Great Kids, Better Citizens. And over a period of time, uh, the coalition government then asked Graham Allen to do a report on early intervention, which he did, and published and part of the rec and one of the recommendations amongst many others was that an independent foundation or foundation, not in the sense we fund others, unfortunately, um, uh, organisation for the <coughs> to, to 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 get early intervention off the ground. And at that time, the then party leaders uh, across the coalition government and the Labour uh, opposition um, all endorsed 
the thinking behind the Early Intervention Foundation. From, of course, there's all consensus and made really quite different sort of perspectives on it. Um, but that, uh, that's part of where we came from. The other part, which is why I think we're not quite like some of the other What Work centres, is that um, there were many attempts to, to do early intervention and preventative activity in local authorities over a long period of time. Graham himself created an early intervention city. Um, and so we, there, there were a sort of group of local authorities who were very much a part of the creation of the organisation. And we worked initially and still work with local authorities, the sort of early, early adopters we call them of, of early intervention. And then there was a group, an advisory group, which was partly sort of political coalition that Graham created, but of voluntary organisations, think tanks, people interested in social finance, again, very involved in the creation of this organisation. And, and then the sort of on the evidence side, um, a lot of uh, the sort of US approach to randomized control trials and so on, which I'll talk about, um, also was a kind of part of the, the initial report that Graham did, which looked at things that had stronger or weaker levels of evidence. So there's a, the sort of clearing houses, as they're called, um, was also part of, uh, of how, of, of the sort of influences of the organization. And so the What Works label, is something that was sort of layered on, actually, into it wasn't conceived as a What Works Centre. It, it was sort of added in very late on in the negotiations that went on between government uh, and the creation of the organisation. Um, I think what we're interested in is trying to use evidence to inform practice and policy. And this is the sort of uh, the way in which we work. And I've been thinking about how, whether this... And we're not as... This is not done in a linear way, in the sense that we have circles, um, but also I don't think we are as, and that might imply that it's just linear. So we are interested in generating knowledge and evidence. Uh, we want to communicate and disseminate that in a way which is useful, meaningful, impactful. And then we work with, whether it is, it might be commissioners, or it might be local places, uh, or it might be workforces or indeed national politicians to try to get them to think about adopting uh, 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 th that evidence and then we sort of test and learn. And in a sense, we're testing and learning all the way through. Sometimes we don't start at the first bit. We don't necessarily start with doing a review of evidence. We might start, for instance, in working with the police who are trying to do early intervention. Uh, in Lancashire, an absolutely brilliant uh, Deputy Chief Constable there called Andy Rhodes, who just thinks actually this, there has to be a better way of organising the way we do things here. And we started to work with him and then think about what kind of evidence we develop. So they're different models. Um, and then these are some of the places, we're not working with all these places, we're only 20 people, um, but we have uh, worked with some of those places or grouped them. Uh, uh, over the period that we've been in operation. So, um, I, would, I don't know how many of you were here when Nancy Cartwright spoke yesterday afternoon, uh, and it was extremely, extremely good and very challenging and interesting. So, um, we, um, we have actually always said, although it's not always heard, that we're interested in what works for whom, when, and where. Um, and, uh, of course, that's are more complicated, even when you're talking about quite a small strand of evidence, that's more complicated than the message that something works or doesn't work. Um, and, and of course, yes, your evidence is retrospective. All you know, in this, if we're talking about this particular kind of evidence, what you know is something, if we're talking about a, 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 you know, experimental design, something did work at one point in a particular place. Um, what I would see us as trying to do is that we're, we're at an early stage of trying to develop a UK evidence base for early intervention. There's you know, lots of good uh, uh, research and data which is very persuasive about the, the effectiveness of intervening early, but actually operationalising that in a UK context, I think we're still at relatively early stages. We use different methodologies. I'm very interested in longitudinal data, We've done quite a lot of trying to model what we've called early, well, better at modeling late, late intervention spend than early, but thinking about how we might do that. Uh, we do spend quite a lot of time evaluating uh, programs, um, uh, 
quality of research and deep dives. What I think we've done much less of and what I've been really struck by uh, in the yesterday and today is thinking about how, um, how about connecting with sort of people-led data and, and how they and how we do that and that's one of the things I want to think about coming out of today. Um, so in, engagement, um, we often we actually we talk a lot to the places that we work with. Um, we have stakeholder groups who help us shape our questions and our solutions. But it isn't, I would say, that consultation more than co-production. Um, uh, but it's critical because otherwise we get the questions wrong and there's no buying at all to the solutions. Um, we've done two recent reviews um, just to give you a bit of sort of what it is that we've been looking at. One which is um, something we call Foundations for Life, which is about the parent-child uh, relationship from conception to five. And the other, uh, a piece of work which is about the relationship between parents, the interparental relationship and child outcomes. And just in terms of kind of giving you, give you some sort of political context, the first was something that we did from when we started, so parenting and its role um, uh, was always part of the sort of the thinking behind the organisation. The second was commissioned by the Department of Work and Pensions. Um, and we looked both at, uh, we did a sort of a rapid review, systematic review of the evidence. Um, and we also looked at what kinds of interventions are available in the UK with very different levels of evidence for each of those two reviews. Um, but I can talk more about that in discussion. So how did we go about it? What sort of data did, did we do, do or collect? We, we did literature reviews. We did a call for evidence. Um, we engaged with uh, our places and key stakeholders. Um, we have an evidence panel. So an evidence panel, these are the people that uh, currently sit on it. And they... Um, the sort of process of assessing <coughs> the evaluation. I'm now going to talk about programme assessment. So we do other kinds of evidence, but I just wanted to talk you through the programme assessment and the way in which we do that. Um, so the evidence panel, group of experts in the field, um, we assess evaluations that have been done. And at the moment, we're talking about, we're talking about programmes. We're talking about interventions. So it's small things. And that's really important in terms of previous discussions that we've had. So we, we look at programs or interventions that we would call class as early intervention to improve child outcomes. And um, they go through a process of, of we assess them, we bring in ex external experts, and the evidence panel is our sort of final quality assurance. Um, and, uh, and their sort of independence and objectivity is very important to that. And then we have... Um, a, a, a continuum or a hierarchy you might want to describe it as and you'll be very familiar with all of this thing all, all, all of these and, and I'm aware of some of the critiques around them um, so one of the things I think that's interesting about our organisation which is a bit different from the other work, work centres is actually we are interested in all the stages um, so many just focus just on three and four where you've had um, a randomized control trial or a quasi-experimental design and the f number four which is uh, when when you've replicated that many times but w we are also interested in these um, and indeed zeros because it's really interesting to understand you know why they've not got a logic model or a theory of change and this as you know obviously is important to know it's important to know because actually if indeed something is not having an effect, then the children are not benefiting and it's not a good use of funding. We also do a cost rating, um, and that is not an actual cost, but by using, uh, thinking about um, how resource intensive a program is to deliver, we're able to develop a relative cost. Um, and uh, this is a relative cost from one to five, which allows us to think both about the cost and also the strength of impact of a program. And then the really, really tricky issue and the issue that's been kind of coming up a lot. So it's, it is really important to say 
We, we do other kinds of evidence as well, but we do also assess interventions. Interventions are small, and it is really critical that we think about them as part of a wider system. But how do we communicate about these interventions? So we developed a guidebook. And so one of the things about being a part of what Work Centre is that you, you have to find a way of codifying complex information. And that, of course, that's at the heart of some of the difficulties here. So we have a set of outcomes. These are kind of whether it's preventing child maltreatment or enhancing school achievement. And we're interested in thinking about how far these interventions help achieve these outcomes. And we have a strength of evidence scale, and it is possible then to go into one of those windows and then look at um, what programs have been evaluated at what level and what rating they have. So, how, so that tells you something, but it obviously doesn't tell you everything. And so the question then is, <coughs> How should a commissioner or a policymaker sitting in central government use that information? And so, and we've said this you know, from the beginning, that we need to think not only about the strength of evidence, we need to also think about cost and benefit, and we also critically need to think about implementation. Is this, can we implement it in a UK context? Can we implement it in a context of a particular area? Does this fit my population group? Does this fit into actually what I'm trying to do in my local area? So one of the things I was thinking coming out of the discussion from the Nancy Cartwright conversation is at, at a minimum, I think it would be, so I think it is really difficult to say stop doing X or Y because actually you may be, it, it, it may fit into what you're trying to do in your context. So I think what we can, although if something is doing harm, it's really important to know something is doing harm. Uh, and sometimes things do do harm, which are very counterintuitive. You would think that they would be beneficial. However, I think the sort of way in which we talk to, and, and, and that advice needs to be mediated to, say, a, a local authority commissioner, is, is really about understanding the local context. So this tells you something and is useful information, but it doesn't make a decision for you. And so I think that's the big challenge about how you communicate this kind of evidence and make it useful and not reductive. So then these are the kinds of ways in which we try and think about how do we support and secure and catalyze adoption. Um, and it would be through engagement with a whole range of audiences uh, from communities, children, and families themselves, although we were not set up to do that kind of direct communication right the way to political leaders at local and central level. And, and we communicate through the whole range of ways in which you would expect. But I think if, in making a difference, I think it's the sort of learning events and networks where you have some sustained communication over a period of time and understand <coughs> where people are coming from and what issues they're facing and how you think about evidence in, a con in their context that is probably most useful. So just to sound back in terms of sort of some reflections, that's a sort of race through. Um, it's really interesting just thinking in 2016 that the political, obviously the political context is very different from so if we think from 2006 onwards, um, and the sort of, when early intervention and prevention was a sort of zeitgeist at one point, and I think it, certainly in the England context is not so anymore. Um, and it's, but it is very interesting to see there are quite big differences in different parts, if we saw different parts of England, so there's some really interesting experiments uh, in, in uh, some of the local authority areas. So Greater Manchester has been really, really passionate about having an early intervention approach. And here we're just not just talking about programs. They've got a really interesting sort of structure for the early years where they think about at the points at which they want to know how a child is faring, the, a range of interventions that they might use in order to respond to that, thinking about workforce training and so on. So it's a very developed model that they're in the process of developing. And Newcastle, I know, also do some really interesting work around 
um, prevention and early intervention. And of course, Scotland, Scotland have been pioneers in this area uh, and continue to be. Northern Ireland has an early intervention fund, which is partly government-led and partly Atlantic philanthropy contributes. So again, there's sort of a different model. And Wales, I have a Welsh colleague here, um, uh, again, have, have been very, very active in the sort of prevention and early intervention territory. But it is, it is, it feels the debate is very different, and of course we've moved from a, a, a time when there was plenty of money sloshing around to a time uh, uh, of austerity, and um, therefore how you deal with the issue of double funding, you need to be able to kind of bring money in early, while still having the same kind of outcomes you would have anyway, is particularly tricky. Um, it's really interesting just in terms of the current, just the change within the current administration, um, over the last, just you know, the last few weeks, months, um, and uh, already quite, you know, quite a big shift in the kind of narrative. <coughs> and as an organisation that <coughs> sits somewhere between sort of evidence and and policy, and although we don't do politics with a capital P, we do engage with um, uh, different administrations and politicians. It is very interesting to see those shifts and to think about the implications. So, parenting is now. I'm sure that it is still on the agenda in the way it was in the life chances strategy social mobility is in discussion so it will be interesting to see what happens um, i still think that evidence informed policy and practice remains very important that it's a really important part of how you make a policy it's just not a, a, it's not a guide to policy in itself um, and learning how to do it well as an organisation that's just, you know, started three years ago, it, um, learning how to do it well uh, is important, but a challenge. Thank you very much indeed, Kerry. And I, I know people have a lot of questions about our presentations as we go through, but if you could hold those in your head or write them down, I'll take debate and questions at, at the end of our uh, session. Um, I'm going to ask our, ne our next speaker, Judith Randall. Judith um, is a co-founder of Development Initiatives. You can see her biography in your, in your pack. Um, it's an independent organization set up to uh, use data and information to end poverty, um, including reporting on aid, global humanitarian assistance, and the data used to monitor GA commitments. So um, this very interesting thing, a set of questions which um, we have yet to discuss a lot in the plenary sessions about the use of data for accountability rather than policy, if you like. I think that some of this comes through uh, very importantly in what uh, Judith has to say. So, uh, Judith. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Nice to see everybody here. Um, I am going to throw out a few things about exactly what Nick said about the relationship between evidence, data, and achieving change. Um, and uh, I'm going to focus particularly on the opportunity that I think is presented by the SDGs. Um, it's a little bit of a scattergun presentation, so you will see different styles and odd slides. I just want to illustrate some of the points that, that I'm, I'm going to be making. The first thing to say is that the SDGs are a different political idea, a different political agenda. Whereas the MDGs focused on halving poverty, on results at the national level, on development, on aid as the resource, the SDGs are much, much more ambitious. Ending poverty in all its forms, including extreme poverty by 2030, even though <coughs> it's universal. It doesn't apply to developing countries only. We're not talking in this north-south, rich, poor paradigm anymore. We're talking universally about things that apply everywhere. And it's domestic lead and all resources. Aid no longer to be seen as the centre of the resource universe. But within this terrific agenda, there is a real danger that we'll get lost, and particularly that politicians will get lost. 17 goals, 169 indicators, uh, targets, 230 indicators, 416 things to remember. I can barely remember my phone and my glasses at the same time. So the idea that people are going to be able to keep this agenda, even in a simplified form, even with 17 goals in their minds, I don't think it adds up to a political idea. And I think that was very interesting, uh, what Douglas Alexander said yesterday, which is it's a great policy framework, but it isn't a political, something with political attraction yet. 
So the question, I think, for those of us concerned with the issue and concerned with evidence is how do you turn it into something that has political traction? So we are trying to work on this. So suppose you take one metric. Suppose you take the poorest 20% of people in the world, wherever they live, whether they're in Britain, the Seychelles, Niger, India. What do we find about the poorest 20%? 20% of the population, 49% of unregistered births worldwide are within the P20. Nearly a third of new cases of stunting every year are in the P20, and this is the killer one. 1%, less than actually, 1% of global growth going to the P20 over time. So if you look from 1990 to now, you can see a very similar pattern. So the, the issue here is we have in the Agenda 2030 actually a terrific narrative. The words equity, equitable, <coughs> inclusive appear all the time. What's the job of evidence and data in stopping the free ride around those words? <coughs> the, I put these slides into my mind, so what I'm supposed to be saying rather than for your edification. Um, but, we hear people talk about pro-poor growth. Those of us with greyer hair around the room will have heard the words pro-poor growth in various incarnations over the last 25, 30 years. How can you have pro-poor growth? How can you achieve it if you don't have a distribution and analysis, if you don't know who's benefiting and who isn't? And you would think that this issue would have been much more effectively dealt with over the years. I'll give you an anecdote. We work a lot with the Gates Foundation. Um, their, uh, one of their key people was talking to the new DFID head of um, economic development and private sector. This is about two years ago. And he talked to her about how his policy was on different sectors, on what he thought about exports and macroeconomics. And she said, what about the inclusive bit? He said, well, I haven't got to that yet. It's not good enough. We have to stop this free ride on talking about inclusivity and pro-poor activity without having anything to back it up in terms of knowing what's happening to that group of people. And the second big change, I think, for evidence, and I think this is a terrific thing, but there is an absolutely clear logic about leave no one behind. National averages cannot tell you who is left behind. Averages in general cannot tell you who is left behind. We need a different approach to data, a different way of looking at information of all sorts to understand who is and who is not included in progress. So let's take an example, one of my favourite examples, and uh, my partner told me not to get indignant while I was speaking this afternoon, so I'm going to not get indignant about this. However, <laughs> Britain decided two years ago-ish that it would stop giving aid to India. If you look at Indian states, which are populous, if you look at Indian states, by numbers of people in extreme poverty, 11 states would rank among the top 20 countries in the world <coughs> for extreme poverty. So our choice was based on middle income status, which is an aggregate that sets a bar, I can't remember the number now, about $2,400, I think it is, uh, of income per capita. And we decided to make a big political decision to, for instance, stop funding uh, governance, stop funding primary education support in very poor states in India on the basis that this national average made it difficult for us to do so. So there's a big question there about how we challenge in Britain the evidence around that. And again, looking at the logic of leave no one behind, uh, if you look at this matter of Uganda, and I can see Charles is going to look at this very closely, <laughs> can come in detail. It's a bit blurry because it's, uh, it's not, it's off the um, the, uh, the blue and the green is the least poor, the blue is next, and the red is the poorest households. So if you look at the areas of Uganda, you think you can see a pretty clear pattern. Unsurprisingly, the north is the poorest and areas around Kampala are the richest. But if you pull out that box around Kampala, you can actually see that you've got huge diversity. You've got people left behind, uh, this is just in terms of income. Uh, in the areas that are also very well off. We have to change the way we address these things if we're going to be logical about uh, working on, on leave no one behind. Um, now, another thing that Douglas Alexander said yesterday was about people 
uh, willingly pushing the evidence to one side, and we sort of take it as reasonable that no one should push evidence to one side. But surely it depends on whether the evidence is addressing the questions that need to be answered. So we tend to get obsessed about certain things because the money flows to those things and the commissioned research flows to those things. So you will find, including by our own organisation, an absolute wealth of analysis about humanitarian assistance, that 5.7% block of international flows that go to uh, countries in crisis. But actually, why are we not addressing all of these other things that are much bigger in financial terms? They may be less proximate, there'll be differences between different places. Well, if, if we're only answering the question about humanitarian assistance, we're not addressing the question that should be answered, which is about all resources and their impact on what we're trying to achieve. Whoops, sorry. Similarly, if you look down here, this, whoops, this bit that you can't even see, I couldn't actually even click on it, um, is humanitarian assistance. All of those other coloured flows are the ones you saw in the donut chart a minute ago. If you put government expenditure on top, it's even more invisible. Now, in some countries, humanitarian assistance per person is more than government expenditure countries like Central African Republic. So this is not about aggregate numbers. It's about looking at the interaction of these different financial resources. And if our evidence is led by the lens through which we view things, we are humanitarians, we look at humanitarian assistance, we are interested in FDI, we look at FDI, we will not look at how you achieve the most uh, for um, getting the most value out of resources. So again, I think it's a, a different uh, dynamic that we need to have. Around, uh, around the questions that we're trying to answer and the holisticness of the data that we're trying to use to answer them. Now, the third thing I wanted to talk about is really about whether we should use certain types of data and the political economy around uh, data and information and evidence. So these are people campaigning <coughs> in Uganda against maternal mortality and saying that 16 women die daily in Uganda. If you look at any of the, if you look at the SDG on maternal mortality, if you look at the campaigning organisations on women's health and on uh, uh, infant and child mortality, they will all use data that's based on this. This is the algorithm that is used to calculate maternal mortality data. It takes three things. It takes GNI per capita, it takes fertility rate, and it takes one piece of survey data, which is skilled birth attendant. I think it's great this academic audience. I can see why she's looking at the <laughs> equations here. Um, now, the effect of this, there are two effects of this. The direct effect is this tells you zero about who is and who isn't dying as a result of a maternal death. It doesn't tell you where they are, it doesn't tell you their name, it doesn't tell you their experience. It tells you the probability that in a given country, at a given time, a certain percentage of births will suffer a maternal death. If you want to leave no one behind, that data is not going to help you. If you are a hard-pressed official trying to think, where should I spend my money, that data is not going to help you. But in, I haven't looked this up, so we can have discuss this, my guess would be that in almost every scholarly article, on maternal mortality training, it will be the prevalence data that people are using. Now, should we do that? Should we go to our politicians, and this is where we come on to the political economy, should we go to our politicians and say, Minister, we think this conclusion can be reached here, without saying, actually, this is about the data. So if you, the, you can see the incentives, particularly for campaigners. You want to have something clear and straightforward to say, Minister, you want to achieve change. So you don't say, Actually, this data is modelled. Actually, this was based on a survey in 1998 and it wasn't very good at that. You don't want to say that. Now, I think there's a big opportunity for the academic community, particularly, to out the poor quality of much of the data on which policy analysis relies, to make it much more acceptable, in fact, to make it unacceptable, not to highlight the quality of the data which underlies these so I put that out there for, for discussion. But the other aspect of the political economy is another sort of leave no one behind. 
When people see this type of thing that you see on the screen, most people don't understand it and feel intimidated by it. So they don't engage in the debate because they feel it's not for them because they can't read that equation. I can't read that equation. I was talking to our new director, who is really excellent, last night. And she was saying, well, I didn't say anything in this meeting because I felt I didn't really understand enough about it. So the consequence of this is that you exclude people from the discussion. And if you look at where the intellectual energy and the resources have gone over the last 20 years on data, they've gone into that type of analysis. They've not gone in, for instance, to civil registration systems. Civil registration, counting everyone, Having a starting point where you know everyone in the population, being able to use that to know who is missing, leaving aside all of the other things about legal identity, being recognised by your government, being equal before the law, and being able to open a bank account, and all of the other benefits. Civil registration is really poorly funded because the incentives to invest in it for the, this great ecology of development knowledge are much less than to do another aggression based on data without highlighting the quality of the data. I'm putting this out there for discussion, so I'm, I'm being a bit polemical here. But I think that broadly speaking, this is true. So how do we change that incentive? How do we get actually more attention to getting the data that would enable better understanding, not simply on doing regressions on data that, uh, uh, that we already have? Um, I think this is more or less what I wanted to say. So, no it isn't, sorry. Um, so when we're looking at the SDGs, we need to think about what's the evidence that's going to serve the political idea best. 15 years, quite a long time in some ways, quite a short time in others. How are we going to constantly bring in, year by year, evidence that keeps driving attention to the poorest 20% of people? So what we're going to do is we're going to look at just three things. Income, nutrition, civil registration. Are people better off? Are people better nourished? And are they known to their governments? Let's start with that. Let's see if we can have data on that. Secondly, whatever you're doing, whatever sector, you should know who's left behind. It shouldn't be possible for anybody to say, we're making progress here, without somebody standing up in the room saying, what about the P20? What about the poorest 20%? 20 years ago, people were standing up in the room saying, what about gender, all the time. We don't really need to do that now because that's become, progress on that has been very fast. We need that same attention. And then lastly, and this in a way is the biggest and most complex area, we need to have data that's disaggregated <coughs> on identity. So we have sex disaggregated data to some extent in some areas. We have really poor disaggregation by age and disability. We have some geographic disaggregation, that's getting better. And we have some disaggregation by income. This needs to be a standard. But beyond that, looking forward, what do we need to do about evidence that relates people's identity to their ability to participate in society more fully? Really interestingly, the, if you're interested in this sort of thing and you read the UN Statistics Division Disaggregated Data Workshop Outputs, um, <laughs> which is a minority interest, I know, but the Kenya Bureau of Statistics named four things that were priorities for them at the moment. Two of them were transgender and violence against men. Uh, that's really interesting to me, that those issues of identity, which go so far beyond this very crude disaggregation here, are, are on their list for things that they should do. <coughs> so again, I think this is a big challenge for the type of evidence that people will need to produce in order to ensure that no one is left behind. And that really is what I'm going to say. Thanks very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Judith. That was a very interesting presentation. Okay, our, our next presentation is from uh, Professor Alistair McGregor, um, Professor of Political Economy uh, at Sheffield University, uh, formerly of this parish uh, here in Bath. Um, and um, Alistair is a, is a professor, as I say, of political economy. So addressing some of these questions, again, that we've touched on in different discussions about institutions, social classes, the politics and the construction of um, national economies, international uh, economic action. Alistair. Very much, Rick. and um, thank you for inviting me uh, to 
who participate in this. Um, I'm sort of uh, taking the risk of not having PowerPoint and working off what I've heard in the, the conference, uh, the symposium thus far. Um, so this question, uh, where next? Um, evidence in the politics of policy, uh, policy making. Uh, Nick mentioned of this parish, um, teaching policy process with Theo 20 years ago, maybe something like that. Um, Aaron Woldavsky's great uh, book title, The Art of Speaking Truth to Power, um, remains uh, very significant. And I think we've heard quite a lot of this business of what's the art, political craft, um, and what's the issue of uh, truth. I think if we brought uh, Woldavsky's thing into the context of this discussion by heart, we're actually talking about politics. So there's euphemis euphemisms in this nice statement. And by truth, we mean contestation and power. Um, the, I'm also uh, have an advantage position because I've just started being external examiner to the development, to the professional doctorate here. So I'll speak to you also. I notice on your reading list, you don't have Magione's uh, evidence, argument, persuasion. And anybody that knows um, me knows that evidence, argument, persuasion. Uh, Ian, uh, Gian Domenico's um, book on the policy process and how we need to think that evidence doesn't win arguments, but the evidence has to be formulated into arguments, and politics is about persuading people. But this combination of evidence and argument actually constitute a basis to, to change. So I think the, um, so what he's basically saying is look, just don't believe that everything is driven by evidence in itself. But I want to sort of take it even a bit further. Because what this uh, symposium and the discussions in it have done for me is made me think about not the politics of evidence and policy making, but the politics of evidence itself. And whether we need to pay attention to actually what are a quite a fundamental politics about what constitutes evidence. Um, and then think about how that particular set of politics plays out <coughs> in the relationships in our <coughs> policy processes or in our foundations or institutes or global movements like the SDG movement and previously the uh, Millennium Goals uh, movement. Um, I wasn't obviously able to go to all the parallel sessions, but uh, so I'm talking from the ones I was in. Um, I was particularly struck by uh, Graham Room's presentation um, and his uh, the way that he was sort of breaking that down. He talked about hierarchy of evidence, um, the uh, and the, the sort of move towards a sort of rational way of thinking out. Well, when is this gold standard of randomized controlled trials appropriate and when is it, it not appropriate? And what really struck me, Graham, was the sense in which that hierarchy looked quite like a kind of a continuum of technocracy to politics, so a technocratic approach to a political approach. And that's where my work essentially has kind of gone, the extent to which um, new approaches to development, and particularly the kind of well-being approach, actually are going to be co-opted into a technocratic approach. So they become more numbers that are in equations that are increasingly difficult to understand, or whether they maintain some of what was the fundamental essences, which what's important for you in your life here uh, in, in this community. So we do have, and we had that in the the, the panel session just before uh, lunch, this sense that there's a great fear that uh, the well-being agenda, which seemed to promise hope for a kind of new paradigm, building on capabilities approach, SENS work, and bringing in some of the insights from different aspects of social psychology was going to offer us something different. But there's a an issue now of whether actually it's a kind of slippery slope that basically becomes increasingly impenetrable and becomes increasingly incomprehensible to the people who you're talking 
uh, to about their well-being. I think if uh, the other theme that's uh, kind of come up in all of this is, um, and again, it's sort of drawn by by Graham's thing, this sort of logical route if. These conditions prevail, then randomized control trials are possible. If these are not, then we might move to another paradigm uh, to generate evidence. And I think the, the essence of the, the issue of the importance of plurality is quite important. So um, plurality in terms of uh, knowledge, but also ways in which uh, knowledge is produced. I think if I was thinking about it, if I was uh, being discriminated against in terms of my beliefs and how I behaved in life in almost any other sphere but academia, I would have a court case to take to somebody. So, you know, I'm sorry, you're, you're not getting the money because you're not sufficiently quantitative. Or, you, you know, this is not a randomised control trial. So, actually, you know, it's not, it's not going to count as much. And what you do really isn't as valuable or as important. I think there's an awful lot in the policy process, you know, listening to Douglas Alexander about, and others about the importance of having the data, having the figures, about the extent to which we actually kind of open up this debate about how different ontologies and different epistemologies are actually <coughs> legitimate. So plurality in the sense of actually there are different ways, there are different values at stake in terms of how we perceive the world and how we believe that legitimate knowledge should be built. And this question of whether, um, I, I sort of wrestling with this, is whether we can have a pragmatic approach where we recognize that we can, you know, it's not all or nothing. It's not you're either this or you're that. And if you're this ontology, if you've got positivist epistemology, then that's that and everything else drops. The question is whether there are hard words. Can we be pragmatic? Now, I don't have an answer. There's a lot of words here about pragmatism in the policy process, pragmatism in bringing the right kind of evidence. And I think we do need to do a lot more to think about the extent to which um, there is a legitimate place for different ontologies, depending on what's the issue you're looking at, what the scale is you're looking at it, and how appropriate is that particular ontology and epistemology to uh, the provision of evidence? I don't know. Um, but it's a question. And certainly to those of you on the doctoral training program, I would strongly urge you, and anybody doing a PhD, to figure out what your particular ontological and epistemological position is. It might be very painful, you might write a lot of words and then throw them in the bin, and that's okay. That's what happens with methodology chapters, generally. Yeah. Um, but figure it out, and figure out what is the dominant ontology in your area of policy. What is it that actually is counted more as truth in your particular sphere of, of policy? And ask yourself, I think, some of the questions that both uh, Kerry and... Um, Judith are asking, is, is it serving actually what the ultimate purpose is? So going back to the purpose, so the purpose of the SDGs are not just to reduce the numbers in poverty, but to leave no one behind, then what is the appropriate ontology and how appropriate are currently dominant ontologies and epistemologies, and similarly with early years interventions. Um, and I think the place being an academic and therefore able to kind of duck the difficult stuff, at the <coughs> um, I think there is a big challenge for us in the academy. And I think it's a legitimate and important challenge. If we retain the idea that we want to make a difference or we want to contribute to making a difference, then I think part of the struggle is actually challenging this discrimination, um, these structures of power in terms of hierarchies of ontology and epistemology within the academia. We're all going to go through the hoops of the uh, research excellence framework in a few years' time. We all teach our students, and it's all about really, uh, in terms of our roles, is what is it we're teaching our students? What is the zeitgeist of the moment? Um, do we follow the zeitgeist? Do we challenge the zeitgeist? 
And also, it's what are your colleagues teaching your students, their students? Because it is, it is, a, it is a collective activity. Um, and I've not even mentioned economists once, and there are not very many of them in this room. But I think there are some serious issues um, in terms of the role of the academy in challenging the political nature of evidence and how we engage with the policy process. I say that because there was a conference on Monday in Sheffield in which basically we were told various ways in which we should change in order to accommodate or to appeal better to policymakers or politicians, but there's never much said about how we should actually be trying to change policymakers and politicians in terms of how they hear and understand uh, different forms of evidence. So there, I think we've got a bit of a struggle. Um, I think we do need to push back, not just think of politics of the policy process and how can we manoeuvre, but actually think about uh, the future as being much more clear about what the power and politics of different forms of evidence is and what our role is in relation uh, to that politics. Thank you. I should have asked you to sum up the uh, actual conference at the end. <laughs> it was very, very it was an excellent uh, summary. <laughs> Um, oh, thank you. Great. Um, okay, so um, can I ask um, uh, Deb Bhattacharya to, um, to speak now, um, as people will know, from the Centre for Policy Dialogue in, in Bangladesh, and somebody that's had some pretty important roles in the policy community of, of his country um, and internationally, uh, as you'll see from his CV here, um, his uh, time uh, in the WTO, uh, UN office, and so on. So thank, thank you very much for being here. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I don't know whether I should feel, feel pleased or intimidated or scared for agreeing to sit on a round table, which, is hap which happens to be a rectangular one. <laughs> so <laughs> that, that, there goes your you know, evidence and politics, uh, how it, what, whether it is really physical or conceptual, virtual or real. So that's something we we'll leave it to them. Uh, I don't know what I heard these three presentations, three excellent ones, and every time I hear a presentation from yesterday, I get more and more confused. You know, there's so many new ideas, so many new terminologies. For people like us who had been data generators as a traditional research institutions, uh, those who have done policy activism with those data as the think tank, had been in the government as the recipient of data and also both in the national and global frontier. And now in this process of SDGs in where the new data revolution is unfolding, whatever that means, uh, so it's, it's very difficult for us to do these things. In those cases, when I have this kind of confusion and I do not have an organizing thought, I always fall back on my grandmother's advices. My grandmother didn't finish university, definitely not Bath University, uh, but she was a very wise lady and she told me, never say more than three points in one go. <laughs> People will never remember the fourth one. That's also an, you know, evidence. That. So I will stick to my three points to, to start with and see whether I can really bring up some of the issues which went through yesterday and today and which comes also with the, as the, how I prioritize some of the new challenges which we see in our countries. Yesterday during our session, uh, we raised the issue that uh, this evidence issue should be looked upon both from the supply side and the demand side. Most of us over here are the suppliers of evidence. Uh, very few are uh, in that sense, uh, other than in your earlier incarnation and yesterday morning keynote speaker, they're on the demand side. Now, exactly wh whose demand we are dealing with? Or are we doing, dealing with a static demand or a dynamic demand? Or we are also trying to influence the structure of the demand or the nature of the demand? So uh, in, once this issue gets complicated, we also add another dimension to it, that is upstream demand and downstream demand. So the upstream demand is essentially the policymakers who are in the government, and downstream is your constituency, the, you know, any intelligent citizen who is interested in policies or how it impacts your life. Now, if you look at the community which we are here, possibly we are more interested when we say about policy influence, we, in, we imply the upstream demand, uh, that the, the ministers, uh, bureauc uh, top bureaucrats, sometimes the tra uh, trade union or the business leaders, but we hardly talk about downstream demand. And why downstream demand is important, I will come to that. 
uh, is talking about other than the generalities we do on talk shows or writing uh, blogs or ed editorials, op-eds and other things. So I think uh, it is important for us uh, to understand uh, the, the nature of the demand, upstream, downstream, or the type of de demand which is coming from the establishment or outside. So it, one has to really zero in which is, what is the core constituency. Now, Aliasa mentioned that teaching the students that may become the core constituency, helping the student to have a structured thinking process, and then they go on, uh, you know, spreading it to through others. But the others may directly interact with the policymakers, the other may through interlocutors and etc. So this is one particular point I wanted to <coughs> highlight that we didn't get much of a discussion on that particular part. At least I didn't really get it, both in the these in uh, supply and demand and within that upstream and downstream. So the downstream demand becomes important now, which is my second point, in when we talk about policy making in, in a discontinuous circumstances or a disruptive environment. So most of the discussion which is takes place in a developed country is that as if it is a policy influencing in a steady state. So we have the institutions in place, we have the processes in place, what is important to generate the data and has to be a good one and then we put it into use and a very intelligent minister will essentially bite the bullet and will do the rest of the things. I'm oversimplifying a complex reality. So but the issue is but just imagine a situation where the government changes every three, four years through election, if you are lucky, the government may change otherwise as well through other interventions, and then you have a total overhaul or discontinuation of the policies. And then, uh, to top it again, the donor community changes their priority because they have also changed the government or also changed the top chief economist in the DFID. I, I just, it's, it's just an example. No, other organizations can have that too. So that can happen. Also, the, your comparative advantage, your competitive advantage has changed because of changed global circumstances. The oil price is going down or going up, and etc. So it has a serious implication. And a new global agenda has appeared over and above that. MDG is over, SDGs are there. Thus, imagine the complexities within which, in a disruptive or a discontinuous circumstances, you are doing that. And to top it all, you're the leader of the ruling party has died, and you're the son and the sisters and or the daughters are fighting among themselves who is going to have the legacy. So within that, how do you really do the policy continuity, and where do you really invest in that circumstances? Do you invest in public discourse? Do you invest in the possible in prom uh, promising young leaders, you invest in a civil servant who will never do anything, but you know, over time will become wiser when he retires or she retires. <laughs> and, and then you, you come to a situation when the global positioning has changed because till yesterday it was democracy and good governance your priority, now it is safety and security. So you have got into a totally new circumstance. So I think this is another area where we, it is important to understand in fluid circumstances how do we do policy making, where exactly we put our uh, eggs in how many baskets within that demand supply and upstream downstream framework. To, co to conclude, here then the issue of the third issue is the issue of the evidence. From our, for us, uh, the issue of evidence or data or information is like drinking tea. Why drinking tea? T stands for transparency, E for effectiveness, and A for accountability. I, I, that's another grandmother's advice, trying to <laughs> abbreviate them in a convenient way. So, uh, the, so evidence at the end of the day, why the evidence is? It's not, is it really for policy making? If the policy making is so cumbersome and also so unpredictable in certain ways, and if you, and you may not be lucky to have a good champion as a minister who can understand some of the things what you are telling. And, and, and if you, so the first issue is that then what you do with this? Obviously, uh, the information and data we use but is subject to a quality assessment framework. I think particularly coming from the non-state actors, this has become very, very pertinent now, that a quality assessment framework has to be applied on getting this data or evidence, at least in terms of its credibility. Because, you know, it is very politically sensitive one, that one who uses the data. In Bangladesh, for example, if, if a information is spread out, people do not ask what exactly is that information is about. They first ask, who said it? The second question is, why did he say that? 
Only then he wants to know what has been said. <laughs> so you see, this, it, it's very politically sensitive how you really deal with this. So if credibility in, the, in terms of relevance, in terms of its accuracy, in terms of its frequency of availab availability, how do you really pursue that, uh, coherently integrated with other, other data, these are all very important. How do you do that? But having said that, what we have also learned, uh, what we, that we have to be a bit less perfectionist. There are two issues over here. One is that we need to learn how to settle for the second best. First best never happens. You see, this is something idealist uh, researchers or an idealist campaigner should understand. It is a, in a constrained circumstances we're doing that. Yesterday, Charles asked me, you having frequented all these spaces, what, has, uh, what type of experience do you get? I said, I refer to what uh, Sarah White in the morning mentioned about humidity. I think humidity is possibly one of the major things you learn, that you have no idea about the constraints within which a policymaker really operates. We have no idea about that, so you should feel, feel like crying for him sometimes, so, but uh, for the right reason. And uh, my whole point is that the uh, second best solution, with a constraint, within a constraint circumstances, in a contextual circumstance, and the third, uh, second along with that is that, Evidence has to be coupled with a political narrative. Without a political narrative, we will never be able to sell it to the policymakers in certain ways. Unfortunately, we have taught ourselves to be so pious and so clean and so pristine that we think political narrative is not something which you would like to do. So that will bring you the right, the final question, which is a, you know, a, 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 the question which you face before you, in the fag end of your career, is that, Maybe this different, if you really wanted to influence the policies, then instead of doing an independent think tank, you should have become a partisan think tank. Partisan think tank is possibly a more effective than an independent think tank, because this presumptuous, you know, op, you know arrogant, independent thinkers <laughs> think that they have all the answers to all the problems and will, will get into the game, but will not, you know, get themselves dirty. It is other people who will get dirty, and I have the, the, only the idea of giving you the suggestion. It, it is your fault that you don't understand what the things I'm saying. So that is how it is. So I think if some, this is a very critical choice which is coming up. It also refers to the, you know, the policy making in an uncertain world, that at least if you're in a policy, <coughs> in a partisan policy think tank, then at least after five years, and according to Professor Pierce, after 10 years, I asked him what is the future of the Labour Party yesterday. <laughs> so, uh, if it may be 10 years. So, <laughs> so uh, uh, this is the Chatham House, I think. Because I, would have, I need to go back home too. So, <laughs> so the issue, issue is that, uh, uh, that at least after five years or 10 years, you get a chance to test out your good, bad, or ugly ideas. But if you can be an independent think tank, you may wait for time immemorial and never get the chance in that way. And you can end up only attending Bath University seminars. Thank you very much. <laughs>I sort of want to take that as an in defense of politics, you know, in a kind of Bernard Crick way, rather than a kind of an attack on the <laughs> academy. Um, but uh, <coughs> thank you very much. That was excellent. Okay, so we have, um, we have some opportunity for um, discussion and debate now. And uh, uh, there's loads that's been raised in that session. I hope you found that as fruitful as I did. Um, if you'd like to just say who you are um, when you ask your question, that would be great. And we've got some mics uh, going around as we speak. And Graham, Graham has his hand up. So just if we could come down here, Graham. <clears throat> Thank, you very much. Thank you very much. Um, so I've got a question for uh, Kari Oppenheim. Um, it was very interesting to hear about, uh, from the inside, as it were, of one of the What Work centres, and uh, in a sense how you started and then how, what approach you've taken. Um, and when you talked about... Um, how you were positioning yourself, you talked about the United States as a significant point of reference. Um, and so, in a sense, my first question is how far, for example, European experiences were also taken as a possible point of reference in uh, trying to learn for uh, action in the UK. Um, 
And then the second bit of my question is, um, we had a talk yesterday from Helen McCarthy, was it? Who was talking about institutional memory, how far institutions remember what happened in the past. And you did refer to how much existing research there was on early interventions <coughs> in this country and that there wasn't a great deal. I mean, when I started out as a postgraduate, um, the university where I was was just writing up the main report on the educational priority areas back in the early 70s. And that included uh, randomized controlled trials and <coughs> more humanistic type of paradigms <coughs> for evaluation uh, in precisely this field. Um, so, uh, so I was interested to know how far you, you went back in terms of your uh, center's memory of what had gone on before. And that, if I put those things together, I want to relate it to something that Alistair was talking about. Alistair talked about the way that the political and perhaps the academic uh, structures in which we work privilege certain ontologies and epistemologies over others. And Alistair asked us to push back against that. Now, how far, if you're in a work, in a work, work center, how far does the, the, the intellectual and policy power structure in which you find yourself oblige you to look at the United States rather than Europe and um, discourage you from going back to a period of labor policy making in the early 1970s um, and in a sense requires you to be somewhat forgetful um, for politic because of the political context in which you're now, which you're today having to address and perhaps you're having to say, yes, what you're doing is new. It's not been done before, it's fresh, it's innovative. Um, so how far do you find that those sorts of political pressures um, uh, or implicit assumptions are, are part of the, the, the world you have to address? Kerry, do you want to pick that? Yeah. yeah, so that's um, uh, a, a serious set of questions. Um, thank, thanks, Graham. I think, um, uh, so the, the US influence was very much in, the, in the, that first report that Graham Allen did, and um, the sort of the, the paradigm of, um, first of all, thinking about interventions in itself, which is, feels actually somewhat alien to uh, a sort of UK social policy context. We, we, we think more about services than we think about interventions. So um, I think it did, it shaped. So I, you know, I came into an organization which had a certain set of KPIs. Uh, um, we are not solely funded by government, but we're sort of probably about 80% funded by government. So that obviously, um, shaped the work program of the organization for its first three years and we're just into a, a fourth year. So I would say we are very interested in European uh, models of change um, and, and, and other, I mean not just European models of change but obviously we, we, we started where we had to start. Um, it, it's probably an oversimplification to say it was only US but I think that you know certainly was kind of a part of um, the thinking. So one of the things that we've been doing is developing links with other, with other countries who are involved in thinking about early intervention, not just early years, but work with children and families. So um, I would say, thank you. Um, yes, we were. Um, I, can you hear me at the back? I feel like I, you can hear me. Um, uh, I, I would say um, uh, uh, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a fair, fair response. But I think we're trying to respond respond to that. Um, institutional memory. I mean, I'm quite old, so I should have an institutional memory, but not, not probably as the, um, uh, the EPAs. Um, I think, I don't think there's any pressure to sort of ignore the past, you know, when you were saying, um, do we have to present everything as though it's new? Um, but, I th but I think because the organisation was set up to look and evaluate individual interventions, um, it, it meant that we didn't draw on a set of other kinds of evidence and research. So I worked with IPPR before that. I was a, I'm, I'm a policy researcher by background. I'm not really an evidence uh, uh, person. So um, 
So I think that, so therefore we went into a certain <coughs> kind of evidence because that is, that is what we were set up to do. So then comes your, kind of, your question about well, an Alistair's challenge, which is, are we in one particular paradigm? And I think we've got scope, you know, I think there is enough openness. We are independent in the sense that we can now shape our agenda. Of course, there's always the question about where the money's going to come from. And so I think there is scope to think about, well, I do, you know, I think there is a role for thinking about how, individual, how effective individual interventions work in a particular context, but there are many very other, very important other sorts of questions. So if I just give you one example of a piece of work that we're doing on social and emotional skills. So we're very part of the thinking behind the organisation. This, this was a neglected area because it's harder to measure. Um, uh, it has a sort of, it's not seen as important as cognitive skills and so on. So we, um, we're doing a piece of work which both begins with um, longitudinal data and understanding inequalities and gaps in the development of that, which I think it provides a really helpful context. Um, we're working with people in the field, whether it's from schools or youth sector and so on, to understand what they're kind of grappling with, what are the issues. And, and we are also doing a call for evidence for what are the kinds of interventions that they, in practice, try to use in their local schools. And we're thinking about it because it's, it's, we went to funding to the Joseph Browntree Foundation. We're thinking about its relationship with poverty. So having come actually from a poverty background, I thought a lot about labour markets and income. Now I'm in an early intervention territory. We think a lot about the quality of relationships inside families. Thinking about them together is very interesting. So I think we could do a very interesting combined methods approach to tell us something about what are the role of these skills, how important, how do they differ depending on for, for different groups in the population, and how should we respond to them. And the responses, of course, could be at different levels. So the response might be this sort of in intervention looks like it might be more effective in this kind of setting with these sorts of skills. Or it might be, actually, we need to sort of shift resources in a much more dramatic way to um, how we tackle people falling behind at the bottom. So I would say I think there is scope, and it'd be interesting to, to see what, what others think and, and you know, the Welsh What Work Centre as well, whether, whether there's, a, I think there is a freedom to develop your own way of doing evidence. Um, but of course, it, of course, yes, we are in a particular political context and there is a very strong, you know, the rationale is about trying to improve the effectiveness of, of evidence and use resources more effectively. Now, you, you know, in, in a, in a, uh, at a time where there's a lot more money around, those choices become much easier to make than when resources are particularly constrained. So you could say, actually, we should be having an argument about austerity, um, as opposed to kind of operating within the, within the kind of political confines. So if I didn't sound too defensive, I'm just <laughs> trying to... Can I, can I just, before yeah. I go, just to yeah. follow up on that, though, Kay, just, um, is there in the structure of the What Work Centres uh, a sort of bias towards evaluating and researching programmes and interventions rather than institutions and sort of structures that might endure in a society over time. I mean, so I, for example, I, I did a talk at uh, the local economic growth what works yeah. centre three year anniversary. Yeah. They had evaluated loads of programmes, amongst which were apprenticeships. Yeah. Uh, now, the word apprenticeship in the UK is entirely different to how it's used in something like Germany or Switzerland, or where the political institutional economic context is, is totally different. Yeah. And so, uh, you, you know, is there something about how, how, you, how the centres are set up that makes it hard for you to research? longer-term institutional yeah. context. Yeah, absolutely, I, I would say. Do you, do you agree? I agree. Yeah. So, you know, yes, you are... You, you, yes, it, it, you know, but apparently there's a, a you know, there's a, the people want answers to policy solutions, so they mm. don't want you to... And, and, and actually, you could, you could look at, you know, is this piece of legislation actually going to be a useful piece of legislation? Mm. But actually, I think they are set up, and there's an attempt to try to create a common language that goes across centres, which drives you in that direction. Yeah, interesting. Okay. Yeah, Ali. Uh, yeah, so my question is for Dr. Bhattacharya. Um, uh, my name is Ali, and uh, I had a think tank like policy based think tank in Pakistan, so I could totally understand and relate, relate to uh, in the in the sense you were relating to the politics of the think tanks and 
Um, and I was wondering if I go, I, I go back and tell my board, let's become partisan. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, build probably a I will. Huh? Build a new one. <laughs> yeah, yeah or, or no, maybe export someone in a party. <laughs> But I think, uh, on, a, on a serious note, I, 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 you know, I was thinking, and um, I, I, I will go to the extent of being political. That makes sense. Um, that uh, a think tank uh, can be, can take in, and should take a, a political interpretation of their arguments. Should be concerned about the the political implications, and should be concerned about what kind of political landscape exists uh, in in the policy prescriptions they are producing or data they are producing. But uh, uh, you know, going uh, to the extent of partisan, uh, to me at least, would not make sense because, uh, for business reason, um, you know, because a government a party can be in power for maybe ten or fifteen years, so you don't want to be out of the business for so long, <laughs> uh, because you know you never know if Bath University accepts you or not afterwards. <laughs> Uh, but but secondly, also if you look at the uh, in the variations in the policies, uh, you you know you will not notice a drastic change in let's say how trade policy is being actual being practiced, as opposed to the the meta narratives. And if you are into policy space, perhaps you will find some uh, individual ministers, politicians across the political spectrum to engage to rather than becoming tied to a, a party, which will then and expose uh, the credibility of the think tank. And also, at one point, you might be tempted to actually get paid by a political party, because political party comes with a lot of resources. And so that's a risk of going that uh, path, I guess. Just, you know, Maybe your thoughts on that. Yes, yeah, would, yeah, oh. would trust you. No, I, I agree with your analysis in that way. Some of us have been precisely doing that, uh, not becoming partisan, but being political. So th there is a fine distinction between that. We think we have that, but the public perception doesn't have that. Because in a very highly polarized political circumstances, if you are photographed with the minister, your rest of your career is done with. You see, it's not the other way around. Like if you're photographed with your minister, that your influence has increased. It's, it's very tricky in that sense. So, but at the end of the day, it is more value-based policy analysis instead of power-oriented policy analysis. That we, it has to be made clear that the think tank or the uh, analyst is not becoming a variable in the power equation. It is trying to pro influence the, the policy process, not necessarily uh, bringing about so-called regime change. Yeah. So I think that distinction has to be uh, somehow maintained in that way. But in, 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 in the policy practice, how do you really do these things? What happens is that uh, it's also an issue which, if I can raise, is which appeared from your discussion, is about who is funding the evidence generation. So who is really funding that research becomes very critical. So how do you, if it gets, uh, you know, somehow the credibility of your outcome document uh, or things, gets sullied by the lack of credibility or alleged lack of credibility of the funding organization that is. So just to give an example, in our center, in our 25 years, we have never taken money from two sources. One is the government of the country, another is the World Bank. So because we are essentially in debate with the World Bank on the donor side, uh, on the policy reforms, we are essentially in debate whoever is in the government on that side. So that is too, we have to, and that is how the public perception becomes very important. It doesn't matter how independent you are. At the end of the day, it's the public how they judge you or your credibility. That is the assessment framework I, would, I was talking about. So, but you see, it is not devoid of the context within which it is, uh, happens, you know. This, and my with apologies, I want to say that we discuss various kinds of evidence generation and its effectiveness and how to put it into the policy process. But the issue is they're so contextual that well, can you really write a manual for that, even for communication tools, not to talk about the, the outputs or how we put it on that. So uh, there, there is a various theories and you know, things we can talk about, but when it comes to practice, is very local, it's very contextual, and within that, 
you have to really understand the actors, the set of actors who, who interact with each other. So th that, that is a different ball game altogether. And in the, I don't know whether one can have a textbook for that. It is in the hard way we have to learn and possibly listen to our grandmothers. <laughs> Okay, thank you, that's great. Okay, so a set of questions along here. Should we take, take a bunch of questions in one go? So start here, then we'll work along that row. That'd be great. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'm, uh, I'm Mohammed uh, from the Professional Doctorate Program. Uh, I'm from Egypt. And uh, actually listening today, after, after we've been like here for almost two weeks, and uh, now the discussion is, is turning a little bit from only concentrating on evidence and how strong evidence should be to the interaction between you know, uh, the researchers and the policymakers at the end of the day. And in our part of the world, actually what matters more is dealing with, the, with egos more in, uh, in terms of, <laughs> of just trying to convince rather than relying on, on, just, uh, on just evidence. Of course it matters at the end of the day, but it matters more in a, as was mentioned in, uh, like in Bangladesh, is, uh, is basically who's, who's presenting, how you're presenting it, and at the end of the day, uh, how credible you are. So, and credibility doesn't come from how good is your evidence at all. It comes from different, uh, from different sources. So you can be like a, a great sportsman, uh, you come out and talk on politics, and you would be listened to. So it was kind of, uh, kind of interesting that today, I mean, that that shift is uh, is happening. What I'm, uh, I'm, it's just a comment, and it's not it's not basically uh, a question as such. Uh, but I believe that uh, as much as we're looking in evidence and how we actually can uh, can make it can make it better, uh, there should be also uh, a concentration at the same time or in parallel on how to understand the dynamics uh, of communicating communicating policy. Or, or evidence itself. Uh, and I believe that it would be beneficial in a way to, uh, to start putting some psychology in it. Uh, because at the end of the day, I mean, that's what matters more in, in terms of, uh, of to, to get it into the implementation side, I would say. But thank you. I mean, it's been... Uh, thank wonderful. you very much. I mean, as we pass the mic along, I think that's, that's very true of anybody, and a lot of people here have worked in think tanks so know that a lot of the process of engaging with politicians involves <coughs> tacit knowledge and networks and relationships and things which are very hard to quantify, very hard to study, mm. but they're critically important to how policy is formed and made and the relationships you have with politicians. Um, Charles. Thank you very much. I'm Charles Luangantale. Uh, work with the Humanitarian Leadership Academy, previously with development initiatives. Um, a couple of questions. The first one is, um, I've not heard very much about the role of ideology uh, yeah. in, uh, in this uh, conversation and whether uh, the dominant ideology or narratives uh, in the world today have an impact or should have an impact uh, on uh, how we uh, as researchers or policy entrepreneurs uh, operate. Secondly, uh, to what extent do researchers in the North uh, recognize um, if at all, that uh, they too need capacity enhancement or capacity <coughs> building, um, uh, especially in context issues, but also in how to, um, with respect in particular uh, to uh, research uh, happening uh, elsewhere beyond uh, the northern borders. And finally, uh, what scope uh, exists for um, for, for having or promoting cross-organizational, institutional dialogue and discussion, uh, including uh, political leaders, uh, researchers, and other players uh, uh, around yeah. uh, 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 discussion tables uh, in dialogue. Yeah, very interesting. Okay. Um, yeah. uh, thanks. Tony German, also apologies from Development Initiatives. Um, I'd like to say something which is not exactly a, a question, it's more of a comment that I hope people would like to comment on. Um, I think it's very timely and important that you, Nick, and Susan have put this conference together, looking at the evidence and politics process across the development sector, but bringing in a lot of strong perspectives from the UK social change uh, sector. Because I think in the past, uh, at its worst, the civil society and academic community have 
have dealt with developing countries as if they were a giant test tube to some extent and an interesting place to look at policy processes. And now that we have the SDGs and we're going beyond ending poverty by 2030 to the more tricky question of leaving no one behind, it's much clearer that the agenda is a universality agenda about how you stop the poorest people being left behind, not just in developing countries, but in every country. <coughs> and I think, therefore, we need to look at the evidence to policy process as one seamless picture and not say, well, it's different in developing countries. And I think there's a big potential for cross-fertilization between the evidence that's tended to come from the development sector, which has mm -hmm. is, is had a bit of a narrative of its own as if it's hermetically sealed, but actually the social change processes that are at work and the political processes that are at work are the same in every country and we can see them up the road in, in Midsummer Norton and Radstock just as we can see them in, in Bangladesh and Burundi. So I think that the, the, the opportunity of building on this, uh, looking at the, how the evidence to policy process works to do more about actually bringing together um, evidence uh, and the policy narrative from the different sectors is, is very timely. Thank you very much. I mean, I uh, I have to say my, myself that um, I have found some of the most interesting challenges to the kind of technocratic delivery state sort of agendas that have been quite powerful in the UK it has come from people doing development studies, actually. So there's a, real, there's a really important read back into uh, you know, what you might think of as UK or OECD policy making um, from some of what's been learned in uh, international development, uh, which is, that's really important. Can I, can I perhaps ask Alistair and Judith to pick up some of these points? Um, uh, that have been raised, Charles's points, uh, and those that, that have been made, and then this, this question from our, our colleague in Egypt. Okay. Um, so, to, trying to just sort of uh, pick up on, I can't pick up on all of them. Um, the role of ideology, and I think this is quite, if you're going to deal with the politics of evidence, then you need to look at the relationship between evidence and ideology and that's something which the natural science model has sought to kind of drive out or at least give us a view that there is no place for ideology in it and that I don't really buy that and I think ideologies have within them ontologies and values that we then see played out in particular um, approaches to evidence so I think that's quite I do think there's sort of fundamentally a place for ideologies as systems of values of how we will view the world and then try and understand and study the world. And I think it's important to kind of explore that. The one that we, that preoccupies uh, current political economy, um, polit politics departments is the whole, the relentless move of a kind of neoliberal worldview. Um, and it's right at the heart of Sarah's presentation earlier about relationality, about whether we're basically adopting an ontology that's got the notion of the individual, desocialized individual at the center, or whether it's something that's a more social uh, notion of a human being, I think is absolutely fundamental to the issue. Um, I talked about power and I'm, you know, one of the things you're painfully aware of in development is the <coughs> power that has been abused and uh, misused in the development relationship between rich and poor countries by donors and, and recipients. Whether it's in very crudely in the setting of the agenda, so now we're dealing with security, whereas before we were dealing with governance or we were dealing with whatever. Um, and I think the, the more insidious form is, the, is the, uh, that which relates to methodologies and evidence. So the whole experience of DFID and Duflo and poor economics and how we've actually been doing a bad job uh, in the past and what we need is basically to get to randomised control trials and that will become the gold standard for how you do work in developing countries. I mean, my experience of it is it throws up horrendous issues if you start talking about interventions and you start talking about control populations, those that are not going to be treated 
with social protection, those that are treated with social protection, horrible um, and really quite uh, problematic, but a, an abuse of power, quite straightforwardly. Um, or at least uh, an exercise of power that needs to be transparent and needs to be, to be understood. And of course, it'll change. Uh, you know, as Deva Priya has pointed out, you know, sort of mm -hmm. development has this tremendous ability to forget. It's apparently, social policy in Britain also has great potential to forget. Um, but actually, it forgot that for years it was spending loads of money on this and it was pushing this and it was saying, this is how you should be thinking about economic policy or social policy and this is how you should be thinking about generating evidence. And then all of a sudden, it said, well, we, we didn't say that. We've, we've moved on to something else. So I think it's, it may sound quite kind of cynical, but I do think, you know, anybody that tells you, you know, you're just looking, we're just looking for the truth and we're looking for the best evidence, I think you see, you kind of just raise your eyebrow and um, push a bit deeper. <laughs> Even if they are huge egos, which there are large amounts of in both academia and politics and so there we are. That's all I've got to say about you. <laughs> and as the no, no, I'm, I'm just asking this whole evidence and, uh, and truth. Ah. Is, there a, is there a the truth or it is only a version of the truth? If you go down the line of plurality, I think if you push down the line of plurality, then you, I think you pushing into an area, however uncomfortable it may be, that according to that person's values and therefore their understanding of what the world is and what, how you understand the world, for them that's the truth. So the, I suppose implicitly then, not implicitly, what I'm saying is there are multiple truths. The question is which truth is more true? <laughs> and that is your value. Well, then you relate it to the end point. And I think we keep forgetting to relate it to the end point, which is is it making the difference that we intended to originally make the difference in? Mm. Actually, on that point, <laughs> before I, <laughs> coming, the, I thought it was very interesting on the, uh, from the ONS that on all the objective indicators, things had got better. On all the how do you feel indicators, things had got work. So the question is, what, what you had this nice phrase, what is counted as truth in your area? Mm -hmm. it's, a very, it's a very, very pertinent question. And you, know, you can easily say, well, it's how you feel. It isn't how you are. How you feel is pretty important. Anyway. But I have changed as well in between. So the person in terms of, no, going back to you, that you say these people have improved all their indicators. Mm -hmm. But they may not feel the same way yeah. because of, because the person has undergone yes, change. Exactly. No, I'm not saying it's not valid. I'm not saying it's not valid. I'm saying that it, I found it very interesting that there was this very clear divide between these two sets of, of observations on how the British public were were feeling or not just feeling. Um, so I'd like to pick up Charles's point about uh, capacity enhancement and cross institutional dialogue in particular, and I'd like to come back to a lot of the political economy issues. So, I mean, obviously there are issues about who's spending the money, what time frames it works over, what the terms <coughs> are, and so on, and those are pretty well known and pretty clear. I think it's, I think there is a whole myriad of things which mean that the capacity enhancement that people talk about doesn't tend to be a south-north, to use an outmoded term, to use a, a south-north capacity enhancement. So let me give you an example. We've just been doing some work in Kenya, Charles will know about this, on uh, the use of humanitarian evidence in decision making and whose evidence counts and whether evidence from institutions in East Africa is treated in the same way as evidence from outside. And one of the bits of feedback from uh, DFID, it is, from DFID was, well, we asked you to look at how people feel about our no regrets policy. I don't know if you know the no regrets policy, but this is a particular policy. And actually, you've not really looked at this slightly different policy, which is called risk something or other. Now, as soon as you start to have those institutional bits of vocabulary which, uh, to which are attached 
whole bodies of you know, analysis within the institution, you exclude everybody who is not up to date with whether no regrets is the term you should be using or something else. And when you put your bid in, you're not putting your bid in using the current vocabulary which happens to be in fashion. You're using some other outmoded vocabulary which excludes you when KPMG go through their list ticking off who's going to, to be going through to the next stage. So there's a whole set of things about who is excluded and included in the dialogue which prevents this type of capacity sharing. Then I think there's another um, area which we haven't really talked about, which is the kudos that is... Uh, obtained by organisations by having policy or research. Um, we all know that in, I don't know if this is true elsewhere, but you know, on the Today programme in the UK, a new report being issued by X, Y and Z is the way that gets you coverage. If you're an institution, you want to own that report. You don't necessarily want to share a report, you want to have the value of it coming back to you. And that means that institutional sharing is not something that is necessarily uh, very easy um, to achieve. And I just wanted to put a third thing on the table for the discussion, which harks back to what Deb was saying about demand and whether, you know, what sort of demand research is responding to and indeed whether there is effective demand for research coming from many people who would need it. Um, the, the question of at what point does what information have real traction? I think we don't spend enough time on. So we've been doing work again in northern Uganda with district officials about what information they have to make decisions. And the, firstly, the interesting thing is how much they value the information. Secondly, there is a lot of information. It's not necessarily digitised or aggregatable, but there's lots of information there, but not that, that usable. But where is the point where we should expect to have traction? With the district official? With a head teacher? With a minister? That question is so important about, as well, who mediates the evidence, because the person who's going to have credibility with the district official in Catway is not going to be the same as the person who's going to have credibility when you do something at Brookings. So I think that, that question about, going back to, I think, when you introduced it, or you know, I think, Kerry, you mentioned, um, who and where is your target for this, I think is, is critically important. OK, thank you. OK, let's have one another round. Yeah. Maybe, yeah, yeah. rather polite, because maybe it, my, my, my reaction is a bit related to this question of ideology, but, you know, I live in America, and, of course, I keep on thinking, well, but there is a whole political party, the, one of the major political parties has somehow been, has, has decided that they do not believe in the evidence of climate change, and it is so widespread, and it is so firm, and it's so entrenched. Mm -hmm that whatever evidence is, is out there, it is, just it is just rejected as a hoax. I mean, this is, this, these are the terms that are used. And it's not just in conversation that they say this, it's in their policy making. It is in the votes. I mean, there is not a single Republican senator who will vote in <coughs> on the basis of evidence of climate change. And, but this is not an accident, you know? I mean, this is, it's not just that if you ha happen to belong to uh, uh, the Republican Party, you happen to be a sort of a science skeptic. It's a result of a concerted campaign and strategy very, very cleverly thought out, financed by a particular interest group. In fact, one particular donor that decided to very strategically, you know, sort of brainwash and <laughs> train uh, particular groups of judges, uh, bring them to golf courses, and I mean, it's a, it's, it's, it was a very clever strategy over, you know, over years and years. And so, I mean, there is this kind of thing that's going on that is, it, it is not a minor, uh, minor phenomenon. I mean, it is just such an incredibly important uh, phenomenon that has affected, in fact, policy making that is affecting, you know, the lives of so many people around the world. Actually, the United States being one of the biggest polluters in, in the world, emitters in the world. So, 
So how do we factor that in kind of seriously? <coughs> you know, this is not, because um, I think that is a serious phenomenon that's going on. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, did, sorry, did you want to come in? Yeah, yeah, Simon. Um, yeah, what was in, in the line of uh, what has already been asked, but about the role of emotions. And uh, it seems that a lot of this discussion on evidence is very you know, rational, rationalist policy tradition. Mm. Uh, and if we bring the narratives and the, the values, the ideologies, the, the emotions, and also the, the human experience, um, uh, what is the role of human experience? Uh, and emotions in, in guiding policy uh, as opposed to data or statistics. Yeah. Mm. Pretty good point. Uh, Tim, yeah. It slightly picks up on that, and it's, I think it goes to Kerry and Judith a little bit. I, I just wonder about, um, certainly when I was at IPPR and Nick was the director, there was a time when we, when we were very, very excited by this sort of notion of the uh, the relational state and the idea of you know doing services not being done to people but being you know, co co-produced by them um, and I'm just wondering about how how that relates to the best available evidence and what works because you know you do have a situation there where there's some value mm -hmm. in people doing it their way even if it isn't from the experts' point of view necessarily the best way. I mean, obviously, you can try and share good practice and encourage people to, uh, to, to, to take um, uh, examples from perhaps other communities where, where it's worked, and at, and at the very least try to discourage them from something that you've got very strong evidence is not working very well. But there's a certain sort of value, isn't there, in just being part of a process and working it out for yourselves. And I guess the, the, the dimensions of that are, you know, Perhaps um, some degree of that doesn't matter terribly much in, in, a, in a society where um, we're talking about you know, a, a service that's uh, important but, but, but not critical, and if it's not absolutely the best that people have produced it for themselves, that's, that's okay. At, 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 in other societies, it might be you know, to, to say, well, have a go at producing it for yourself. It might be literally <coughs> life and death. But I just wonder if you can reflect on that, particularly in the context, again, of sort of... Uh, 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 something that was that felt a bit modish in the UK, perhaps a little bit less so even in the most recent months, of, of where you're decentralising power. So in, in each locality, people are being yeah. encouraged to make decisions themselves. Yeah, which is what uh, Bob Kozak was talking to us about this morning very much. Can we take a couple more? Any more? Um, and then we can perhaps ask the panel to pick up some reflections. So, uh, Emma and, and James. <laughs> I was just trying to uh, uh, build a little bit on that conversation um, because when Severi mentioned emotion, um, I was connecting that to uh, this idea of um, you know, um, upstream and downstream and, and policy happening, public policy not just being <coughs> about the state but about public action and the, the dance which um, some of us heard uh, as, uh, Robinson, James Robinson talking about on Tuesday in Oxford, between sort of state-centric and society-centric um, processes. And, um, and I was thinking about evidence and emotion because somebody gave me this definition, and I can't remember who it was, um, of a good politician as, as, as being someone who knows how to use emotion in public. Um, and um, anybody know the source of that? No, no, no. Very good. Um, and um, and I suddenly, so a light bulb went on in my head because a lot of my work at the moment is you've got good KPIs, you've got good monitoring. How do you generate credible voices to, as it were, and deep dives we can call them, reality checks, to, to actually, which are about causation, not just about change and indicators. How do you generate those, those credible stories of, of change which have to be, to some degree, generalizable. They may be configurations of change in different contexts, but how do you generate those stories that spark that rational, emotional relationship that, Carrie, you talk about the zeitgeist? And so if we start thinking about the mix of, of evidence and the mix of kinds of research and kinds of skills within our think tanks, and I'm not sure I believe in zeitgeist, but for all the reasons Alistair would give us about um, <laughs> Uh, who's trying to promote the view that there is a zeitgeist. But I do think that that recursiveness is very important in thinking about how evidence comes to be useful. Maybe it's 
Nancy would say it's about both. You know, there are sufficient conditions, so we need a sufficiency of strong evidence, but it's not, well, that's necessary, but it's not sufficient because we then need this other kind of evidence, which is maybe often more human centric. Mm -hmm. yeah, thanks, Jen. Um, I've been thinking about, I've, I haven't been to all of the sessions, but I think it's really interesting that we're here at the end of the second day and we slip in that you might be applying to KPMG to get your funding to do your policy or to do your evaluation. And then within a couple of minutes, we're talking about interest groups shaping the political, and we're not really talking about interest groups, we're really talking about transnational corporations, really fundamentally shaping how we interpret evidence and knowledge in, in ways that affect people that are very far distant from them, and in ways which are very rarely visible. So I've been doing some quite interesting research about the influence of transnational corporations over the production of um, security policy in the EU. But I've also done some, uh, uh, the very beginnings of some research about um, the role of transnational corporations affecting um, policy agendas for social innovation. Has anyone heard of the term social innovation? <laughs> it has its origins in PwC and KPMG. It is a management consultancy agenda. And I think it's really important for us to recognize that you know, the political economy of knowledge production doesn't simply lie in states. Mm -hmm. It lies in private actors as well. And I think it's really important for us to pay attention to that. And that for me, I mean, it may not be for everyone. I would like to kind of hear some comments back on that. For me, that relates directly to Charles's question about ideology. It's almost like the ideology is so deeply embedded in the structures that are producing the kinds of practices and knowledge that we use to conduct what we call public policy, that actually we really need to draw much more attention to that. So, just some thoughts. Thanks, Emma. Okay, let's, um, I'm gonna just, let's in the last sort of 10 minutes open this up to the panel just to pick up on the question, you know, the climate change oh. question, the question about whether knowledge is um, produced and dominated by particular interests, um, emotion and reason, I mean, that, those are huge questions there. So plenty you can chew on, but I'll, I'll hand it over to the panel just to sort of pick up as they want those different things. Perhaps Alistair, I can start with you and come this way down the table. Okay. Um. What I'm concerned about is the removal of emotion or the dismissal of emotion um, from the policy and the political discussion. I think um, James's point about um, politicians and the use of emotion, I think, I mean, to some extent, Douglas Alexander talked about that yesterday, about, yes, the importance of the numbers, but also the importance of the, the salient case. So I don't, it's not all doom and gloom. And in our sphere, whether we're talking about poverty, whether we're talking about uh, child early years or whatever, then I think if we lose that human emotional dimension from the work that we do, then I think that's, um, <coughs> that in itself is an important political act. Um, I, I'm, I'm increasingly astonished by the extent to which the the state or states governments are uh, basically parceling out activities and areas in which I would have thought actually these are core to the legitimacy of a nation state. Um, so we know in the UK there's a big issue around health service and so on and so forth, but right at the core of it also is the, the knowledge agenda. Um, you know, so a global knowledge agenda, having experienced with um, Rockefeller a few years ago, pulling together big voices in the, the kind of global scene, which included, they absolutely insisted McKinsey had to be there, uh, PwC had to be represented there, as well as an MP from Ghana and head of an NGO from Bangladesh and all this. So they really have a place, a big place in this kind of process, and 
it, it's, a, it's something uh, to pay attention to. But of course, also, again, bringing it back to politics and our politics, uh, universities, universities as businesses. Um, you know, there's a, globally there is a sort of challenge about, you know, how we go and get money, the extent to which we need money, the extent to which we've got to train people in particular um, ways of being in order to do that. So it, it's potentially everything, and that's the danger. Um, I do think, you know, coming back to it, there is this issue of pragmatism. What is it can we do it, while challenge, while not letting the politics just go unchallenged? What is it? we can nevertheless do to try and effect some change, given the imperfection. So it's not a council of despair, but rather it's a council of actually being alert, um, being aware when things are not being stated, but actually values are being asserted uh, in relationships that we are engaged in, um, in the process. And the, the only point I would add is this business of um, co-production I suppose my inclination is, and I was struck by uh, Lord Kerslake's talk this morning about uh, devolving things down. I mean, I think the, the technology session yesterday about new technologies and people producing data on their own terms for their own purposes are extremely significant. And I think paying attention to um, new trends in terms of people producing the data that is important for them, for their purposes in their communities, is an important thing that we need not to lose sight of. Thanks, Austin. Judith. Well, these are challenging things. So, when you're talking about the emotional uh, engagement, there's a great Maya Angelou quote, which is something along the lines of, People will not remember exactly what you said, but they will remember how you made them feel. And I think that's true. I think that, in my own experience, <coughs> that's true. And I think a question about the engagement around research and evidence is how it makes the person on the receiving end feel. Does it make them feel empowered or disempowered? So when they receive the equation on maternal mortality, do they feel empowered by that information? No, they feel empowered by the thing that says it was 32% last year and it's 33% this year because they can uh, understand that and use that. So there's a big onus on people who are providing the information to think about how it's going to make people feel on the receiving end. And I was reflecting on... So we often get asked to do uh, bits of work which have been done before by other people or by us. And we say, actually, WaterAid, you don't really need us to do this piece of research because we did it for you five years ago. It hasn't really changed very much. Why don't you read that? Nine times out of ten, they'll say, no, we really want you to do it. <coughs> very much. And the reason why is because the people who were there five years ago aren't there anymore. <coughs> and because they want to feel a sense of ownership of it. So particularly if it was done for somebody other than WaterAid, it doesn't do the bit for them. They want to feel that they own it. So this sense of ownership, and I guess that people who are comfortable uh, defending the, uh, the climate change, um, the absence of climate change, or feel comfortable with that, you know? That they feel actually empowered by saying this. They feel they're fighting their corner. It, they feel a sense of ownership of that information. So I think this question of, I mean, a lot of things come back down to how much people feel that they own it. And I think that that's very important. And to relate that to the KPMG, where it's a subcontracted relationship. So DFID subcontracts the, the bidding process to, to KPMG. You get such a long chain away from anybody owning the result or using the result of the data that it devalues the whole process. You often end up doing not what you want or what they want. You've ended up doing something in the middle, which is of less value. Um, and I wanted to make two other points. One is, how much research do we really need? How much research and evidence do we really need? Um, there is an absolute proliferation, and I think this is because of huge numbers of students going through the international development uh, master's programmes and undergraduate programmes in university. Proliferation of policy papers in the UK. 
all of them have got to be slightly different because they belong to slightly different institutions. What value does that have? So, as my colleague in um, Nairobi says, more is written than read. Literally, more <laughs> is written than read. And that's not a healthy environment. So I think we need to be a bit more disciplined about that. And then the final point harks back to something uh, Alistair said um, about the providence, provenance, not providence, provenance of evidence and data. And recognising that almost every bit of evidence and data has got a, a bias, it's got a provenance, that the idea of the objective truth, um, clearly some evidence is more solid than others, and discussing and making transparent the provenance of it is part of enabling people to use that better. And I don't think, particularly on data, that we're very good at making the provenance um, very clear. I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Judith. Kerry? Um, I very much agree with what both of you have said, and, and they sort of echo the things I was going to pick out. So um, it feels to me, on the, on the emotion side, um, uh, that, that we both need to root the research in, in order that it captures people's voices as well as other kinds of data, as, as has already been said. And, and I think that might be something to take back to... I can have a go at taking it back to the What Works network, to just think about different sources of data and different ways of thinking about where you gather your knowledge and understanding from. Um, uh, so that if the way you've conducted your research in the first place draws from people's experiences, then, of course, as you said, Graham... Uh, is it Graham? No. Charles. Charles. No, behind Charles. Jen, God. <laughs> Jen, God. Sorry, apologies. Um, uh, the way in which you convey it and communicate it, therefore, it, it is already kind of um, ingrained with people's voices. So that's a, a very good starting point. Um, but I think the sort of the task of how you communicate and, and touch people um, uh, with the material you want to, to, to kind of create change with is, 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 is really critical. And, and how do you do that in a way that doesn't sensationalise or distort, but is kind of authentic? Um, and, and so in just thinking about your, your point, Judith, about, you know, do we need more and more and more search? And there are all these papers that are written and we, you know, we're drowning in it. Um, is that, so, you know, that the, one of the kind of questions is, well, actually, for... You know, we, we can create evidence, but actually learning, learning about how, how, what happens to it and how to make it useful and how to make it impactful and what, whether people recognise it. Or, and that bit is much less, much less researched, actually. So, um, and, and that, that feels, feels also very important. So, um, so ways of communicating in, in uh, the, the work that we do in a way that's, that's simple but clear and can, can connect with people's emotions does feel very important. We need to understand that better. Um, I was thinking about, um, Tim, your question about co-production and the sort of tension between things that people will do for themselves and seem to, you know, they like, they want, it feels effective and this sort of what might feel like a top-down approach to what has been found to be effective. I mean, of course, you can evaluate different ways of co-producing things. So I was thinking about one really interesting example that the, the big lottery fund has funded, which is, a it, people may know about it, it's, it's based on the early years, it's from conception to three, it's in five areas, a lot of money going in over ten years. Mm -hmm. and, and it does try, I think it does try to do things, it, it builds from the community, um, it is in partnership between the voluntary sector organisation and the, the local state, the local authority. And um, there's lots of discussion and consultation about how you frame and think about um, messages and what you see and perceive to be um, as problems. So I think there, there's some interesting uh, experiments that, that are going on which, are, which at attempt to take co-production methods but also apply, let's evaluate, let's learn about what seems to be a more effective way of working together to, I don't know, do volunteer parenting in one area than another area, so it's not necessarily incompatible. Um, and and then really, um, Alice, is your point about sort of pragmatism and but also challenge. I mean, I think, of 
course, you know, we're operating within constraints and we want to try to make change uh, <coughs> within those constraints, um, but it is incumbent to, to challenge at the same time. And I, I guess that's the sort of um, what you navigate as somebody that sort of sits between these worlds um, rather than in you know, one particular a part of that world and that that you know we have that's that's the world in which we operate and it feels very important to still carry on doing that but in a way that is sort of true true to your own principle thank you Karen yeah. I will need more time to think through it's, it's, it's time to internalize all these talks it's not easy uh, but to what made me think is more a couple of issues which came from the colleagues in front of us. Uh, one issue which, again, about the truth, evidence, ideology or values, is that as we move forward, I have a feeling that we will have to uh, justify more and more the investment we are going to do in generating investment, uh, evidence. Uh, it will fall in the paradigm of what, what we, the new, the, the new framework of uh, theory of change, uh, which is preceded by logical framework issues, uh, the, the capturing the outcomes, not the outputs, and also going back um, behind on the evaluative science, how it has done. So I think one major issue, and it will take me back to the issue of the T, that transparency, accountability, and effectiveness, that uh, we have been increasingly under pressure to justify through a cost-benefit analysis, that the investment in evidence generation has been rewarded by greater generation of public welfare, if not at a household level. So I think that science has to come somewhere in operation. But we can take the reaction too far on the result-based management approach. So as if this is one of the most uh, you know, pretentious ones, that you think that everything what changes is because of your intervention, however minuscule that is. Yeah. So uh, the attribution problem, as yeah. you know. So th that is one particular area I think we need to develop the science uh, in terms of relating the changes uh, we see on the ground, and uh, the value of that vis-a-vis -vis the investment we have made in terms of evidence generation and data and information. So this, this is definitely will become very, very critical. It will also become critical for the two issues which has been raised, is one about the private actors coming into the knowledge generation. Last week I had been uh, talking uh, to, as a preparatory meeting for the World Data Forum, which is coming up next year. Um, I saw a preparatory meeting in China, in Gulin, and we had a fantastic presentation from the Alibaba group. I think it will put to shame their data collection and statistical and analysis and research department to any research institution, not to say public uh, data collection agencies. China is increasingly depend getting dependent on Alibaba generating the consumer's price index. And today or tomorrow they might get end up estimating the GDP. They're obviously estimating the consumer demands, its composition, location, and everything else. But they're also, I cannot think of that the inflation rate is coming from a private organization. It, it is something which is given, like just like Bible, that it will come from a public organization. You know, we have grown up with those kinds of things. Yeah. So it's very shocking in that particular thing. So we will have to do those things. Uh, data on the big big data issue. Uh, we have just done uh, last year uh, the part of unpacking data revolution in different countries uh, as a part of the SDG data assessment uh, from uh, an included since it is an universal agenda. We included China. Canada, Turkey, and other countries, and obviously Francophone, Anglophone, African countries, and Bangladesh as a least developed country. What shows that there is little traction for the big data in the low-income countries. So the love for big data increases with the level of income. Yeah. Yeah. It's partly true because if you, the big data source is credit card company, so less than 2% of the population in a low-income country has credit card. So obviously, if you do build your analysis on based on those 2%, obviously you are not going to get a representative one, as you will see. Whereas, if you build your analysis based on cell phone uh, statistics, you might get a more representative one, because the cell phone is much more 
uh, the number of cell phones precedes, uh, exceeds the number of population in the country. Everybody is having more than one. So I, I think the big data issues, the big data issues, which you, there are two or three major challenges which are there, obviously. One is the representativeness issue, that is one. The other is also, of course, the moral issue, that, that can you make money out of private gains out of public information. That's also an important uh, moral issue. And last but not the least is the privacy concern and security concerns along with that, which is coming out. And with all the hacking which is taking place, it, it is a major concern how it is. And of course, the big company is going to sell the data, my information, however impersonalized it is, how these issues are being tackled. The, the de developing countries have a much more suspicion over this one. My th last point is that it's about the pri private sector setting the agenda. If it is, this is obviously a challenge, that what we research on, that has been brought out by the pharmaceutical industry very critically. We know those issues. Huh? Where did the pharmaceutical companies really invest? They didn't invest their good money in areas where uh, diseases were more prevalent in the tropical countries or low-income countries and because there was mar no market for it. So the issue is, the concrete issue is, is there a market failure in case of data generation and evidence generation? Is there a market failure over there? And apart from the coordination failures and competitiveness issues and other issues, so who exactly regulates or how do we do countervailing measures in these cases? Is public investment is the only way for research generating public knowledge? in order to deal with the private knowledge over there and how the ecosystem is going to evolve in the coming days as we move, which is related again back to the financing issue as which is good. My last point is that uh, we're on policy influencing, and now I really defend the politics, uh, as you see, is that at the end of the day, you depend on the relationship between the civil elites and the political elites. That's in a broad sense of the term. So if the civil elites and the political elites are in a competitive behavior, obviously the influence will be low. If they're in a cooperative behavior, then it will be good. Now, if you can break up the civil elites into pro-labor and pro-Tory, which we do in our country, then you have another way of looking at it, whether you, your value system, not making you fully partisan, can still allow you to align yourself. So the, you can see the institutions who are more value-wise aligned here and there and over there. To conclude, you see, if you have the, I, I, I only hope that all of you uh, meet your nemesis, those who really do evidence generation. I just finished it with a story. Is that I, ha I was in a great debate, continuing debate with one of our finance ministers, unfortunately he's passed away. Uh, so I won't say bad things about him. So the issue is that uh, I said that the inflation rate is, you know, the press came in, what do you think about the price going up and etc. I said the inflation rate is going up, it is 5.5, it was 5.2 uh, last month. And they come back, they, they said no, the finance minister said that it is 5.1 instead of 5.5. I said, how do you say that? This is, here it is. Then I go and co compare my results and see that I was talking about point to point inflation and he was talking about last 12 months average. I had a big debate with him, telling him the difference between the two, and he had picked up. So the following month, since he was giving the average of the last 12 months, so I pick up the last 12 months average and say, this is the inflation rate, it's going up. And then journalists come back to me and say, no, it is going down. <laughs> <laughs> and then I compare, this time the minister has used the point to point, the point, to point because that was less then what was the average of that? And I was the one who had a big debate with him and explained to him what is the difference between the two. And he very purposefully applied that. And so what I'm trying to say is that, is that we may have lots of evidence, but we may not have wisdom. Wisdom may have wisdom. He's very wise. That's, that's fantastic. Um, you have a knack of ending on a very perfect note. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I'm going to say that, in a, to your relief, I hope, in a change to the programme, I'm not going to speak for half an hour trying to <laughs> summarise uh, the symposium. I think that would be very foolhardy and, you know, you'd fall asleep and I'd keep you from the drinks reception which we have waiting for you outside. So, um, 
I'm just going to say a few words, and then Susan and I perhaps will do some thanks uh, to those that have organised this symposium. Um, a, just a few things on the themes, because I think one of the purposes of this co conference, this symposium, uh, was to provoke people to think about things differently, to bring into an engagement one with another different disciplines, but also people from different backgrounds, both national and international, uh, political, practical, academic, and so on. Uh, for me, one of the themes that's come through a lot, although we didn't program it into the symposium, is that there is a lot of buried political philosophy in uh, these sorts of <coughs> policy um, discussions. Um, we've just been speaking this afternoon about emotion, uh, passion in politics, how we think about the role of emotions in how we do our politics. The American political theorist, uh, Bonnie Honig, people may know her, she's a kind of agonist theory um, theorist, she writes about objects of public love and their importance in public policy discussions. And to give an example, in the 2012 US presidential debate, the Republican candidate, Mitt Romney, and our colleague here will know this one, um, said, look, I, I don't think we should be paying our tax dollars subsidizing public sector broadcasting. Uh, uh, and he referred to Sesame Street, you know, the famous uh, US children's program. He said, you know, I love Big Bird as much as anybody, but I don't think we should be taxing you to pay for Big Bird. And in response, there was an I Love Big Bird campaign. Um, that was an object of public love. You know, the equivalent here would be the National Health Service or, or the reaction to the proposal back in 2010 to privatise our woodlands. People said, look, these are our ancient woodlands. We do not want them sold. And so the role of uh, objects of public love or of emotion uh, uh, and of, of passions which motivate people in politics and which shape public policy are incredibly important. And we have, we have tended to discuss things uh, in the course of this symposium through the lens of rational deliberation, through the lens of trying to reach consensus, of thinking about the use of reason. And as, again, Bonnie Honig says, when thinking about some of those processes, if that's all you do in politics, firstly, you misdescribe your object because you, you lose sight of passion and all the rest of it. And secondly, you end up, and she, she, she quotes the famous German philosopher, she says, you end up like Habermas kissing the typewriter. And I think that's a rather good way of thinking about politics, that if you don't understand the, uh, the conflicts, the, reason, the, the, you know, the, the, the emotions and passions that are involved, uh, you miss a lot. And we've also, I think, also had a lot of discussion, albeit submerged, coming to the surface about, well, what do we mean by the purposes of policy, well-being, social justice, leaving nobody behind, uh, income in the world? <coughs> These are all things which are probably, properly the subject of political philosophical discourse. So that's one thing. That's, it's really important. The second, I think, is we've had a strong strand of the kind of philosophy of science, um, most particularly, obviously, from Nancy Cartwright yesterday, but it's come through again in this afternoon's session. What do we mean by truth? What do we mean by causality? Uh, how do we adjudicate between different claims? How do we think about the levels of, at which things are active in public policy? Uh, the standards and tests that we apply? And how do we turn those things, how do we jump across the divide from is to ought? How do we turn those things into values which enable us to motivate our public policy and our political action. And that seems to me, again, to be very, very important here, that a lot of public policy thinking as a discipline can become quite procedural and process orientated and lose sight of the kind of uh, scrutiny that is required and important um, when thinking about, as Alistair has put it, the different ontologies and epistemologies. Those things are incredibly important. It's very hard to study public policy and think about it unless you have some grip and purchase on them. And if you don't, you end up inhabiting other people's ideologies. And we've, we've heard a lot today about ideology. I think that's very important too. And national regimes of knowledge and knowledge production, the political economy of knowledge production, again, it's a big theme that's come through from us. And then finally, just on the sort of politics and policy making, we tried to leave in this program with people who are in politics, uh, we could talk about the craft of politics, the practices of politics, um, both from the perspective of a, a politician and also today from the perspective of a, a civil servant. And each in their ways, I think Douglas Alexander, Bob Kerslick and others, have brought to the surface uh, for us in our, in our discussions, you know, that there, is, there are lots of ways in which politics is conducted, some of which are not understood to us well, some of which is, is about tacit knowledge, is about <coughs> um, learned behaviours uh, and, 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 and about dark arts as well as open and rational ones, you know, there is a lot of that in politics. And, and that, again, it seems to me has come through a lot today, the importance of relationships, of networks, of how you do things, of how you balance your political concerns with your policy concerns, the evidence base, versus the practice of politics. So that, again, seems to me to be a really important set of considerations. And then finally, of course, there are what those things mean for universities, how you think about impact. Is it a linear process where you're trying to 
uh, have influence on policymakers? Or are you speaking truth to power? Or are you problematizing your own evidence as you problematize their practice? These are all incredibly important questions for how we think about impact in the universities. Unless we want other people to tell us what impact is, we need to debate them ourselves, come to our own views on those things. So those are my thoughts. There's a lot more I'm sure we could say. And, and with our doctoral <coughs> students tomorrow, we've got a chance to talk about it. Again, so I hope we can uh, thrash some of these things out uh, and glean some more insights from them. But I want to ask Susan if you would come up. I just want us to say uh, thank you to the people that have organised this symposium for us. So uh, IPR, Amy uh, Thompson, my colleagues Amy Thompson, James Hall and uh, Claudia, uh, Claudia Cervantes, Torres Cervantes, um, who did loads of the organisation for it. Thank you very, very much.